Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey Asynchronous Time Warp Knockreiner. Let's do the time warp again. <laughs> okay. Wait, is that copyrighted? Uh, is I somehow uh, mixed an uh, Oculus reference with Rocky Horror Show pi picture sh Rocky Horror Picture Show reference, so extra weird. You probably have no idea what's going on, audience. On today's episode, we will dive into the world of Oculus, or the headset Meta. formerly known as Oculus. I can't. I just uh, before can't that, use that word. I have to keep calling them Oculus or I'll get sick. There you go. You're the one that bought literally everything they own. Uh, before when that, they though, were Oculus, they hooked me. They hooked me before they they sold off to someone. It's like those loan folks. You buy a house and then they sell your loan to somebody. Thanks a lot. <laughs> before that, uh, we will cover an update on the ransomware epidemic facing Las Vegas hotels and casinos and then end with the discussion on the latest threat activity of Storm 324, courtesy of Microsoft. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and storm our way in. Man, that was bad. So uh, our first story today is about a company that gambled on their cybersecurity and uh, unfortunately lost. But I'm so, <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, that one's stewing Dumpsh. up all day. Um, last week, uh, the house the ransomware... never loses, Mark. The house never uh, loses. In this case, at least one of the homes lost very hard. Uh, so the ransomware operator or ransomware as a service operator known as Alf V or Black Hat uh, claimed credit for a pretty massive ransomware attack targeting the Las Vegas hotel and casino chain MGM Resorts. Uh, so at the time of this recording, now, what, seven days after the fact, uh, the MGM Resorts website and most of their IT systems are still offline. I've heard online or I've heard on other sources that folks that are currently in their hotels are having to resort to using cash, God forbid. Um, now, Alf V, they, claims, they claim that it's one of their affiliates uh, who are known as Scattered Spider by, I think, uh, who, man, who was it? Uh, CrowdStrike gave them that name. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, they claim that they gained access to MGM's Okta tenant by an, expo an exposed vulnerability that they exploited. Uh, once on the tenant, they were able to ultimately gain super admin privileges within Okta and global admin within MGM's Azure tenant as well. Now, this all started back on somewhere around Friday, the 8th of September. And MGM actually identified some of this malicious activity and yanked the plug on their entire Okta environment, turning off all of their Okta servers in an attempt to stop that damage. Uh, on, on October 10th, they put out that announcement that they had been forced to shut down some of their systems due to a unnamed cybersecurity issue. And it turns out on the 11th then is when Scattered Spider were able to, in fact, launch a ransomware attack where they gained access to, stole data, and then encrypted around 100 ESXi hypervisors and all of their virtual machines. Um, throughout this, Scattered Spider claims they were able to sniff out passwords that they couldn't recover from the domain controller hash dumps that they had uh, while they were sitting on the Okta servers as well, too. Uh, Alf V came out and uh, basically threw shade at MGM and their response all along the way, saying, you know, they didn't understand their own network when they yanked the plugs on their Okta servers, thinking that would solve it. Uh, they threw shade at Virus Underground or VX Underground, the Twitter user, for yeah. incorrectly saying that it had been a basic social engineering attack that allowed them get it, get in through the door. So there's a lot of like, you know, it's still pretty fluid right now. Um, but if you trust what the uh, the Alpha operators are saying, Sounds like it was a compromise of an authentication server that initially got them through the front door. Could still be social engineering. That's in line with both theirs and um, Scattered Spiders' modus operandi over time. But I guess pausing there for a second. Either way, this is pretty massive ransomware attack. Like it made the news almost immediately. It was very visible to the public. If you were in the I hotel, mean, you were locked out of your rooms. Shutting down your hotel and gambling. And that's like tons of money per minute type situation. So definitely a big story. Yeah. Um, 
So this actually isn't the first time that Scattered Spider has used Okta servers in cyber attacks. It was back in August of 2022. They were the ones responsible for compromising Twilio. The uh, What would you describe them as? Not just, I guess they are primarily SMS messaging as a platform. Yeah. Um, commonly used as like an API integration for applications that send OTPs over text message. Uh, through their compromise of Twilio, uh, Scattered Spider at that time were able to intercept OTP messages and then use those to complete MFA authentications against customers. Yet another reason why SMS-based OTPs aren't typically the best option if you have other options for multi-factor authentication. And this also isn't the only Las Vegas casino and resort that was allegedly hit by Scattered Spider this week as well, too. Um, so a little bit later on in the week, uh, Caesars Entertainment filed a, uh, a, a filing with the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, saying they had basically been the victim of a cybersecurity attack that had resulted in some of their customers' data being stolen. I think they even mentioned social security numbers were a part of that dump because as a casino, big winners, you need to report for tax purposes as well too. Um, but they heavily hinted without explicitly saying that they paid off the attackers' uh, ransom demands in this case. The quote was, um, quote, we have taken steps to ensure that stolen data is deleted by the unauthorized actor, although we cannot guarantee this result. And it was also yeah. reported the ransom demand was $30 million in this case too, which is, I guess for Caesars Entertainment, probably a drop in the bucket, but no small amount of change for us plebs here. Um, I wish I one had of the more sizable million. ransom demands. <laughs> well, Corey, you can have thirty million if you uh, just uh, go no, thank extort you. a can Las I Vegas a, casino. I'd like to have thirty million in a good guy way. Yeah, I, I think exactly. I, this is all rumorville. Like you say, we don't know for sure they paid, but some articles are saying they suspect they might have negotiated down to fifteen of the thirty million. It's pretty common nowadays, I guess, for negotiation to happen granted in this case like uh if you're uh like I, I could see negotiating with a smaller business but if i were a ransomware actor and you had a casino they got money <laughs> yeah uh but, you but that's, that's actually a good money. point like there's actually entire like i think cyber insurance providers sometimes contract out with them um, and sometimes there's like individual organizations where their whole thing is they come in and they act as that ransomware negotiator for you, where if you've made the business decision that you want to at least entertain going down that path of paying the ransom, it doesn't mean that you have to pay it all outright. Uh, potentially, you can negotiate that price down like it is at the end of the day. Well, I guess it is very different from a used car purchase, but similar that you can typically negotiate with price on ransomware operators. That said, like the FBI and just about any cybersecurity professional will remind you that paying the ransom doesn't guarantee you get access to the data again. Uh, it just means that you've now given those threat actors additional funding and incentive to carry out additional attacks. Um, our producer pointed out Caesars Entertainment's market cap is just around $11.5 billion. So $30 million is a relatively yeah. small amount, but I'm sure it'll still hurt. It'd be interesting, though, if, if they ever do find if they paid, you know, I, I think, again, other articles correctly point out that while it's not illegal to pay ransom all the time, there there are strict regulatory policies by the, our, the U.S. government's Office of Foreign Assets Con and Control, OFAC. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's more about paying folks under sanctions. But again, uh, our scattered spider, you know, black cat, alpha V, whatever you want to call them, they, they could fall under some of those sanctions depending on where they are. Exactly. Basically, if your ransom demand ends up going to North Korea, who are on sanction lists, you could potentially be held criminally liable for paying a sanctioned entity money, uh, which is the, the guidance that the U.S. government has given out as a reason to not pay those ransom demands. One of many reasons to not pay ransom demands. But, you know, we're sitting here right now on our ivory tower. I can also understand why for a CISO or, you know, whoever's leading IT, it's easy for us to say, don't pay the ransom, but it's a lot harder to say that when you're the one getting punched in the face by the threat actors 
especially if you're running a big entertainment casino and hotel chain where you're literally probably losing millions or tens of millions of dollars per hour by being down. So I understand, yeah. even if I, I want to say I disagree with it and that you should instead put yourself in a spot where you won't necessarily have to pay those demands. Do you know if I mean, obviously, Russia is on the sanction list for a lot of things based on the Ukraine war, but I can't tell if they're on the OFAC one, but I, I, I'm 90, you probably already said this, I'm 90% sure Alpha V Black Cat is tied to perhaps not state sponsored for sure, but Rush, mm -hmm. Russia based threat actors. I believe so. I'm actually not on the OFAC certain. list. I feel like they, they would be anyways, interesting. Uh, Yep. Yeah, they paid the ransom. Not the best uh, thing to do. We advise against it when you can. But I think you're absolutely right about the ivory tower. And and I guess uh, when you have 11 billion, I, I guess that's like, uh, I have $100 and I can live my life peacefully if I pay someone one cent. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yep. I could see why you might pay and yet the problem is you've now encouraged that person to try to go take one cent from everybody else and for the person that might have 10 cents that one cent might be a big deal yeah exactly either way so MGM brought in Mandiant to help do incident response and as what typically happens when a company brings in Mandiant we do tend to get after action reports once they've been able to uh, figure out exactly what happened. Uh, so I'm willing to bet at some point in the relatively near future, we'll get some sort of more in-depth in update from Mandiant on how this all went down. Uh, we'll I'm, I'm interested to hear more about the call. I mean, I know now they, they've claimed it's a vulnerability in Okta, not a call. But early on, there's a lots of stories about a support like a call being one of the ways someone got a credential yep well anyways uh, moving on i've got a topic that Corey's going to be super interested in um so i actually found this already read about uh, i'm sure you did uh so i found this one while going through r slash netsec on reddit um and it was a blog post on a Facebook dot or well not Facebook fb.com or specifically engineering.fb.com, which is Meta's engineering blog, I suppose, uh, where it was basically two members of Meta's application security engineering team published this post describing a vulnerability that they had internally discovered back in 2021 uh, that they had actually turned into a full on exploit chain to gain arbitrary code execution. Uh, with privileges, uh, elevated privileges on the Quest 2 VR headset. Um, so pause for a second. Corey, I believe we had a prediction somewhere loosely around this within the last couple of years. Do you want to reiterate what that one was? Yeah, to be honest, it may not have hit the pro, but I we basically said there, there would be some sort of a VR hack uh, coming out. And it, I, I think we, we loosely based it on because a lot of the new VR headsets, not the Quest 2 in this case, but by the way, the exact same OS, the Quest Pro runs VR OS, same thing, just a different device ID. Uh, we, we said basically the more professional ones used that have production connect, you know, they're trying to do productivity and connect to computers. You might see more VR vulnerabilities that have to do with because those headsets are being connected to business. Yep. Um, so basically, this all started as a part of a normal code review back in 2021 by their application security team. Um, they were looking into a module on Quest's OS that's called VR Runtime. It's a service that we'll get into a little more details in just a second. Uh, but basically, their team found a vulnerability that ended up not making it into production. They found it during this code review and were able to patch it beforehand. But Can I pause not, here and say yeah. we we give a meta uh, I give meta a ton of crap, Facebook a ton of crap, and we'll continue deservedly to do that. So. By the way, yeah, mostly deservedly so. I I preferred Oculus when it was just Oculus, but I think this is kind of a flex because they're actually, as you'll soon learn, they're sharing pretty awesome full technical detail about a flaw that didn't even affect anybody. <laughs> yep, they're basically just doing it to teach. You know, this didn't make it into production. So I just wanted to stop there and give kind of kudos to this security team because uh, this is a good example of catching something before production. And it's almost like they're flexing. Look at all the, the security 
work we put into this before we we release type thing i will say i it feel like it's like the quest is oh go ahead <laughs> Oh, I just I absolutely agree that this is a, a bit of a flex, but it's also like it kind of makes sense. Like the, the way they describe it is they found it before it went into production, um, but they wanted to continue and like show what would happen if they were able to weaponize it. Oh, yeah. And then what would that look like so that they could understand like what an actual exploit against the Quest headset would look like in a real world scenario that they're able to do in this kind of pre-production environment? Which makes sense. That's a yeah. pretty smart thing to do against your your product. But again, that's why I consider it a flex. They're like saying, "Look at how deeply we're thinking about this problem, that we're even, you know, making exploit code to see what would happen if it did get passed." So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I do also now, think it goes with that, the theme. Uh... Go ahead. I, I think it also goes with the theme of the quest. To me, is just a console, and I do think console yeah. manufacturers for pure piracy reasons, go much further on InfoSec than the average IoT device. Yeah, so I I, I do want to put my smart ass little remark in here and that oh, do I love that the, the attention to detail that they're doing here for like application security for their VR headset. I wish they put the same level of detail into privacy security around their flagship social engineering platform. <laughs> yeah, that uh, would but, be nice. You know, I guess when, but one one of, of those two things the makes them money. <laughs> I don't think VR makes them money yet. Advertising and breaking our privacy makes them money. So, unfortunately, I think uh, fixing privacy is not in their best interest. <laughs> Until we make like it, literally we... hemorrhaging billions of dollars from their metaverse. That's what I'm right saying. <laughs> yeah, they're putting all the effort into things that don't make them money, but they're not going to increase the security of the thing that makes them money which is yep. our lack so, of privacy. <laughs> anyways, screw Facebook and Meta, but let's continue with this because hats off to their security engineers. Um, so yes, good job security. I guess some background first, uh, the MetaQuest product line, like Corey mentioned, it they all use a shared operating system that they call VROS, which is actually just a modified version of Android. Um, specifically, they've branched the Android or forked the Android open source project, the main primary open source one that Google primarily maintains, but it is technically open source. Uh, their fork contains additional firmware, kernel modules, drivers, some system specific uh, services like VR runtime, um, as well as some custom SE Linux policies. All of these to make the actual headset itself work because, you know, Android, I guess these days it's used for a lot, but it's primarily a mobile phone operating system. It can also run on TVs and cars all over the place. Um, so it needs some customization to work within a VR headset, though. Um, yeah, so yeah, for example, like uh, you're tracking motion of a head. So there's all kinds of device drivers and things that have to do that, that a phone, you know, may, may have a gyro, but won't have. And uh, I don't know if you go, we'll go into it, but things like uh, a, a synchronous time warp, things you have to do with VR. Uh, that are just extra pieces that you have to add to the Android inf uh, operating system to get things to work in VR. I mean, you say motion tracking as a specific example, but uh, as someone that actually watched Apple's little announcement thing for their fancy new iPhones and iWatches, their whole being able to snap your fingers or tap your fingers to answer or hang up a call on someone with your watch, it's pretty dang cool. Uh, and that is technology that could be useful in the VR space as well, too. But anyways, I they, 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 they have it already, by the way, Mark. My headset has passed through, and rather than having to go to a menu and do it, I tap the headset. And oh, then hand tracking, handy. all the when I'm going menu systems and hand tracking, this is how I click. This is how I do them. So they're, they're, they're doing it in VR already. Now, just wait until we get Elon Musk's neural link plugged into this. And so you don't even have to tap the headset. You just think about opening the menu Deep or pass through. Deep dive VR. It just takes care of it. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then all our brains get hacked. Yes, hard pass. <laughs> and the ads come uh, directly. And controlled by Elon Musk. Even better. <laughs> um, so VR OS contains uh, this privileged service that we've mentioned called VR Runtime that provides features like that time warp you mentioned and composition to VR applications. It kind of acts as this intermediary between VR applications like games or whatever the heck you're using on your headset, I don't know, VR, uh, and some underlying system functions and uh, uh, functionality as well too. 
Um, so because VR runtime is a part of the driver package, uh, a driver package installed on that, it's located in a directory uh, that allows it to run as a privileged service. She gives it some more permissions beyond just a normal Android application on the underlying operating system. Um, their VR runtime service uses a custom interprocess communication channel uh, that they've called runtime IPC. IPC being interprocess communication. Communication. This was developed exclusively by Meta, uh, where it uses pipes and shared memory regions to facilitate communications between these applications and the VR runtime service, which operates as a server in this case. Basically, you can send messages, and there's a little bit of shared memory for passing larger uh, data blocks through there as well, too. We can get actually. So, I'm going at this from like the thirty thousand foot level. Uh, the engineers that wrote this post, they went deep. If you are a application developer or an OS developer, there's a lot of really interesting in the weeds knowledge that they're sharing in this. Uh, this post and even well. for the ones that aren't, you know, some of the things Mark is talking about about the Android framework, the API, the system API, privileged. They they have some graphics in there too that just so we hard to show you on an audio podcast, but uh, I'm sure we'll share the link to this. Uh, so. <laughs> There are sections where engineers will appreciate where they're going to go very deep on a code level, but there's some pretty pictures that actually illustrate things pretty well for those that just kind of want to holistically understand the systems of an Android-like system. Like Corey said, some of us, mostly him, prefer the pretty pictures and skip the in the weed stuff because we're now. I, I super think there's some very cool, pretty flow charts for the very deep RPC pipes as well. So Absolutely. the pretty pictures go down to the engineering level too. Yep. Anyways, last bit of background. Uh, when a VR application launches on the headsets, uh, the application loader um, loads up a API library that lets it communicate using that runtime IPC to communicate with the VR runtime. Uh, there's actually a another process in there that kind of mediates that and bootstraps it to start it up, um, checks some permissions, but then hands it off so that this new application that you could have gotten from the VR store or sideloaded onto the headset can now communicate directly with this privileged uh, VR runtime service. So most applications, uh, including the apps that you get from like the MetaQuest store and ones that you sideload yourself, all run as a unprivileged process, meaning they've got some pretty limited permissions within the operating Real system. Real quickly on it. for for side loading, by the way, the one unusual thing, especially for a console, is allowing that. And I actually really appreciate this part of the quest because, uh, you, know, you know, like an Apple device, you're not going to be able to side load application unless you jailbreak. But their their side loading is not root. You do not have root when you side load. But they have this cool development mode. If you just tweak a, a setting in your mobile app, it turns on development mode, just like the the little switch you do on an Android phone to to turn on basically side loading and uninstall. Or load, three times with call alternating it? eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, is that what I did? <laughs> no. But oh, I blink think three that's times. That's how you turn it on, right? With alternating blink three eyes. times with alternating eyes. I, Maybe that was an Apple's keynote on the iPhone 15. That's how you do it. <laughs> I'm just, but I anyways, the day when you turn on side loading for Android, you had to like click the USB tethering button five times in yeah. quick succession to make the menu item appear out of nowhere. Actually, why five times? That's crazy. It's to stop people that don't know what they're doing from shooting themselves in the foot. Like you have to that actively know how to turn it on. In the order last to Android open. phone I had, it was a toggle switch, but it was a pretty easy toggle switch. But anyways, mm -hmm. I do like that you can offer developer mode, but you do have to turn on that developer mode. You have to actually make a Facebook or Meta developer account too, although they make let anyone do it. But that's what makes it easy to get other applications on the phone. But the key is you still don't have root, but the vulnerability Mark will continue describing is why that sideloaded app could still be dangerous. Exactly. So they pointed out that since untrusted applications can communicate with the privileged VR runtime process, this is like a actual risk of elevating privileges that they were aware of and why I think they were focusing on researching in this area specifically during that code review. Um, so I won't go all the way into the weeds uh, because some of it I straight up don't understand. I'll go ahead and say that. Uh, but I think I've got a high enough level grasp of exactly what's going on here. 
Uh, so the the way, some, some of the, the some of the screenshots are machine language. So if you really yeah. want to understand, you better know disassembly. Yep. Uh, so the vulnerability they identified was introduced as a part of an update that added in a new type of message for that IPC communication channel. Um, and in that message, uh, the let's call it attacker supplied input, which is really the input from the application that you could get from the app store, or whatever that's communicating with the privilege process, that attacker controlled input uh, gets saved into a memory location without properly checking the size of the actual input. And long story short, Overflow. it could allow an attacker yep, to arbitrarily write an eight byte long memory corruption at arbitrary locations or offsets within the process memory by sending specially crafted IPC messages. So within the process memory of uh, the VR runtime process, they could basically overwrite memory locations that were set to writable with whatever they wanted in eight byte intervals, as long as they knew which offset to stick it at. By the way, eight bytes is not a ton, uh, but being oh. able to do it unlimited, I, I, I bet you there's a lot of tricks just to make that exploitable when you only have little eight byte blocks. Exactly. So they went on the hunt to look for corruption targets where they could use their eight byte write primitive to corrupt and control the value of something that would ultimately let them gain control of the execution flow. Uh, they also needed whatever location they found that they could write to like this. They needed to be able to call that specific function with something under their control so they could trigger it to actually execute and then take over that code flow. Um, so do you have something, Corey? No. <laughs> OK. Long story short, uh, they found a function within the Vulkan interface. So Vulkan is a, I think it's open source now, graphics driver uh, initially developed by AMD, at least managed by yeah. AMD still, I believe, but it is open source. They found in that interface a function that they could both overwrite. A little with their hand hold in, in your background has a Vulkan driver on it. That is true. Yes, it does. Um, so they could both write to it, and then they could call it by issuing a, a request over RPC to it. Um, now, the quest is actually protected by ASLR, address space layout randomization, which should make it difficult where even if you can overflow and gain control memory, you don't know where other libraries are located in the memory. You don't know their memory locations, so you can't necessarily execute them. They change them all the time, yep. Yep, um, but they found they were able to bypass that uh, because the application that they that all this is running under, their malicious application, for lack of a better word, is actually forked off of the same parent process as the target process that they're trying to exploit. So because they come from the same parent, they actually uh, share the same or inherit the same ad address space from that parent process. So they're able to interact with it easily. They know where everything is. Exactly. Because the parent process um, knows where everything is. Exactly. Kind of, I mean, simplifying, but. Yep. So ultimately, they were able to gain arbitrary code execution with system level privileges for the headset from their unprivileged app. Now, again, this is all pre production, they patched it. But the like, let's say it made out into the wild, this would mean an application that you download or sideload or get tricked into loading could potentially gain control, for device. lack of a better word, of that headset. By the way, I, I would say rooters everywhere because uh, I like security. I want to protect people. But let's be honest, I am a jailbreaker too. Uh, uh, it is fun when you can actually have control of the device you paid for. So rooters everywhere have been trying to root the quest for quite a while. So. This is so cool uh, of them. Good research and all a good catch. Almost got it. But rooters everywhere were like, oh, man, why did you not release that code? Yep, exactly. So if you remember at the start of this, their goal wasn't just to like flex and show, look at all the cool hacking we did. Like they actually had a goal in mind of developing the full exploit chain so they could see what it would look like and then design protections against a similar style attack in the future. Um, one of the things that they found was a lot of the libraries that are used within the Quest Pro, within the operating system, exist in memory locations that are not just readable, but also writable, meaning that you could overwrite certain pieces of it, and then other functions or other uh, processes could go and read off of it and then execute that code. Uh, they added a protection called Relocation Read-Only, or RELRO which basically protects the pointers, the call locations for these functions 
in these other libraries by making them read only after they're initialized. So it'll load it into memory and then then mark that memory location as read only so that you can't go in and can't override it. it. Yep, exactly. Uh, they also pointed out, so Android uses SE Linux security policies to control and By the mark... way, we, we say it so many times, I'm sure all our listeners know, but SE Linux stands for security enhanced or security yeah. enhancement, one of those two. So just know what? SE Linux is security enhancements <laughs> made to protect Linux. But anyways, there was a problem in security enhanced Linux. So with... Uh... Within SE Linux policies, you can basically mark based off of file system locations with, that something executes or loads out of, whether it should be privileged or unprivileged, or I guess what permissions it should have. Um, and they found that uh, the SE Linux security policy allowed loading libraries out of what should have been untrusted application locations because of it enabled this functionality within Android that allows you to update a privileged application outside of over-the-air updates. Basically, outside of an over-the-air update, you could drop a signed binary or library somewhere, and you could load that into the operating system, which meant that the SE Linux policy had to allow you to load that library from that location. Now, other protections should check and do check to make sure it's actually signed before it can load. Um, but in this case, just that policy allowed them to execute and load this library out of what should have been is a that, Is that their location. SE Linux policy, or is this something they found that the average this SE Linux the policy might be? default Android one, and they even noted that they don't plan on changing it. They just explicitly wanted to talk about it because it is a security risk, but it's also a difficult one to solve while still enabling that functionality. Yeah. So overall, this was a pretty dang cool write-up from their application security engineering team. And as much as I hate the company, these two specific dudes that work, worked on this uh, research project, hats off to you. Yeah, kudos, That's man. Impressive. Golf clap. Good stuff. Yep. Although, and man, too bad we, were... we didn't get our root. Yep. That said, they've proven that it is possible. And they've given a detailed example of one fixed before production area. Maybe that'll give some uh, encouragement to researchers on how and what to look for because, I mean, inter-process communications like this are inherently risky if you're not doing the right sanitization. And if this isn't the only place that's doing it, there are potentially other locations you could research into. It's not like we haven't heard of uh, vulnerabilities in RPC and IPC, both of them remote and inter before. Yep. So definitely places to look. 100%. Uh, so moving on to the last story for today. Uh, Microsoft published a blog post last week describing the activity of a financially motivated group that they are currently labeling Storm 324. Uh, if you remember, when a uh, refresher on Is Microsoft's that what's happening in Texas right now? <laughs> you say that, that there is a thunderstorm rolling through and it just started torrential downpouring out front my window here in my <laughs> office. It's pretty nuts. Uh, I had to turn on my little light here to make sure that it didn't get too dark. But anyways... No, Corey. Storm 324 <laughs> just means that it's a clustered group of threat actor activity where they know it's unique to someone, but they don't have enough information to say that it is distinct from another one or potentially even uh, attribute it to a specific like location. Like, uh, what is it? Like Blizzard for Russia or Typhoon for China. So they don't know exactly where it's at, but they do know at least it's They've got some activity over the course of the last five years. No, crap, like seven years, as we'll discuss, um, related to this threat actor. Uh, so they have been tracking them since at least 2016. Uh, historically, this threat actor delivers email-based infections uh, that they then hand off. Once they've compromised the device, they'll hand it off to another threat actor to then use that access to like deploy ransomware or set up a botnet or whatever. Um, their focus has been on highly evasive infection chains that typically start with a payment or an invoice lure. So you get an email saying, here's your invoice for whatever. And it's actually a link that goes to a SharePoint hosted compressed file, like a zip archive, that then contains a JavaScript dropper. And that JavaScript dropper- By the way, why would that, be... that, that ever work, Mark? Uh, <laughs> a finance team would never legitimately get a zip full of invoices, would they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, By the no, way, this technique works not. and apparently for good reason. Exactly. Apparently people sending invoices like to zip them. Yeah. Anyways, 
so in this case, though, uh, they use a few different file formats for delivering that JavaScript. It could be a JS file in that archive, could be an Office document, could be a Windows script file or WSF file, sometimes just VB script as well, too. Uh, Microsoft Notes since 2019, they've been using the JSS loader specific variant for a, a JavaScript malware, uh, which they then hand off to the ransomware actor Sangria Tempest. Uh oh, I forgot I, Tempest already. Where is Tempest? Yeah, I don't it's, remember. It's it's Asian. It is. <laughs> we should yeah. know this. I don't want to say all the I can wrong think one, about so. is a Sangria sounds pretty good. It's. I agree. It is currently like 85 degrees outside and super muggy. Sangria sounds great. <laughs> um, so starting in July of this year, though, uh, they began using phishing lures sent over Teams messages instead. And they still contain a malicious link leading to a similar malicious SharePoint uh, location. Um, but in this case, instead of going over email, they're abusing and attacking organizations that allow external uh, teams, tenants, or users to communicate with internal users. Uh, Microsoft thinks that they've uh, pinpointed a specific open source tool called Teams Fisher. It's basically a Python-based program that lets team tenants, uh, Teams tenant users to attach files and messages sent to external tenants. Uh, they also note though that, yeah, they also note that these messages are identified as external if external access is enabled for the organization. So there's at least a little Meaning bit of you a can warning. Turn it on. Yeah. Correct. Turn it off, I should say. By but the way, real quick in, insert. I, I always forget for the the storm names, there are four that are not nation state. There are four that are types, and Tempest will make perfect sense to us both based on what we're talking about. Tempest is financially motivated, not a state. There we go. So they don't it may not be in a specific, you know, China, Russia, whatever. It's just they the type of activity in that case. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so this blog post was to describe their new change in activity going from emails to Teams messages. And that kind of that makes sense. Like these days, organizations have a lot of protections for email based phishing, a lot of training around email based phishing, but probably less so for Teams message based phishing. And if I can go in and claim to be Prakash Panjwani, the CEO of WatchGuard, uh, join up and send a message to someone in the company. They don't notice that my email address is actually random whatever at gmail.com, but my name matches someone. I could potentially trick them into opening an attachment or visiting a link to a SharePoint hosted file and downloading and executing that. So you can see why they might pivot to there. Now, Microsoft did make some mitigation changes on their end to help make this easier to catch. They updated their accept and block experience in one-to-one -one chats on Teams to emphasize the externality of a user, uh, so show both their email address more prominently and that the user is external to give Teams users the ability to exercise more caution when accepting them or hopefully not accepting them. Uh, and then they also added new restrictions on creating domains within a tenant and improve notifications to a tenant admin when a new domain is created in their tenant. Basically, as an external person, I could have potentially created a new domain that adds a little more credibility to my phishing message as I go send it to someone within that organization. Could have gotten them to uh, fall victim to that. Now there's got some more protections and auditing for the administrators of these tenants. Uh, they ended with like a dozen recommendations Everything from the high level, use phishing resistant authentication methods, enable Method. conditional access. Yep. Um, down to though, defining which external domains are allowed or blocked, if any, uh, to chat in, uh, within your team's environment. And then also educating users on the risks of externally, uh, external communications and also to review sign in activity, make sure they proactively mark any attempts that weren't them with that wasn't me. I think that's right. external activity. I think you probably have to go with a whitelist method because I uh, unfortunately I think turning off external activity is going to be hard for any organization. Now that we have remote work and other people have remote work, I think connecting via meetings, whatever meeting platform you use is 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 very big. So I think it's actually very common to want to have external guests join a Teams meeting. And sure, some people might say, well, just get Zoom, but everyone's cost cutting. So if you have one one platform that does it well, why have 
subscriptions to 12 platforms. So uh, I like the advice here. I think uh, it, 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 before I was like, teams should just be internal. Let's turn that off. But I feel like more and more we're starting, it's become big enough a way of working because of remote work that you do have to allow external you know, partners. But uh, yeah. don't just turn that sucker on. You just spend time whitelisting. And every time you get a new partner that requires it, just allow them. Because it is, like you said, it's controllable. Uh, it is more work for the security or IT organization, but the trade-off is it's it can chat, be completely it's new. It's chat egress filtering. <laughs> it is more exactly. work to do, but you'd rather pick and choose who you want to talk to so that randos don't start chatting you up and sending you malware. Yep. So if you look up Microsoft's blog post on Storm 324, they do have links to documentation on how to do all these different recommendations and mitigations they suggest. Definitely check that out if you manage your own uh, Microsoft tenant involving Teams. But man, so we've got we've gone from email now. Now we're doing Teams messages. Uh, what do you think is next, Corey? Are they going to fish us uh, through? Does, does this count because there's a Teams app? One of our predictions, we're talking about how maybe the VR exploits are getting closer to our prediction. We had one that messaging apps, which uh, I was thinking WhatsApp, Slack, but guess what? Teams, <laughs> yeah, because when I have Teams on my phone, 90% of the time it's for the chat. Uh, maybe it, Maybe this is a continuation of messaging apps and maybe our prediction actually is hitting. I will take the point. So yes, it is hitting. Go us. Now maybe we'll break 50%. <laughs> but either way, be on the eye or be on the eye, be on the lookout for these uh, newer style social engineering techniques that threat actors seem to be pivoting to. Or don't. Be on the eye or, or keep your lookout for. Thank you. Like I've said, I have the best <laughs> words. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any suggestions for future episode topics or questions on today's topics, you can reach out to us on X. That still doesn't feel natural. I'm at XORRO underscore. Corey is at SecAdept. And the both of us are at hashtag the 443podcast. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week.